morning, St. Matthew. Welcome to church. Next Sunday, August 14th, we'll be having one worship service at 10 o'clock. Be there. Following this service, you will have the opportunity to visit five different stations to put your faith into action. As you walk into the doors, you'll be greeted and you'll be given a colored sheet of paper with your suggested schedule for the afternoon. You'll also be able to choose a lunchtime with that schedule and have five stations that are going to be a wonderful opportunities. One of those stations is going to be in the foyer. And in the foyer, you're going to be able to peruse a lot of different areas of missions and ministries of the church that we're going to be highlighting and you can sign up for them. You can pray for them. It'll be a wonderful opportunity to become a prayer partner for these missions. In here, in this small foyer, we're going to start our annual 2022 23 St. Matthew yearbook. So come in here, get your picture taken real quick. It's 30 seconds. It'll be easy and fun. Another station in the gym right off the Vine Cafe. If you've always wanted to be a grocery bagger, now is your opportunity. So we're going to be bagging food for global missions to be sent out. And that'll be a great opportunity to bag that food and pray over it for the people in need. What are some other opportunities? I hope you have a chance to join me in a letter writing campaign to our military, our firemen and police who've served our nation and our local community. We'll be writing those letters in the library within the church. Remember all those school supplies you've been dropping off the last few Sundays? We're gonna be packing those in the chapel. Come by, help us out by filling backpacks with these supplies to be distributed to Project Compassion, and they'll be sending them out to children in need in our area. And of course, we'll be praying over those backpacks as we finish them up. Also, you're gonna have a great opportunity to spend some time praying for the missions and the ministries that we're going to be talking about. And last but not least, be sure you can bring a friend for this opportunity. And now for the best part of the week, Worship. Good morning. Blessings to everyone in the house of the Lord today. Psalm 116, I love it. I love it. He says, I love the Lord. Do you love the Lord? Because for he heard my voice. God's listening. And I love this. Because he turned his ear to me. I, I love that. When I'm looking at you and you're talking to me, I'm listening and I'm hearing. And when somebody goes like this, they're catching every nuance and every sound. Because he turned his ear to me, uh, turned his ear toward me, I will call upon him as long as I live. Do you feel like that today? Amen. Let's stand and let's worship the Lord. His ear is turned to us this morning. Worship the Lord.
enter into a time of prayer uh, now, and, and maybe you're here today and there's something weighing heavy on your heart, and you need to spend some time with the Lord. You're, you want to offload that to the Lord. Uh, if that's you, I want you to know that you're always welcome to come forward and pray at the altar rail of the church during, as, as we're singing, you can be praying. And uh, if any of you would like to do that, you're welcome to do it. And, uh, and we're going to be singing 10,000 Reasons. And like on the last verse, third verse, um, we're going to be praying for kids and teachers. We're doing the, the blessing of the backpacks today. And so if you're a child that brought your backpack and we want to invite you down to, to bring that backpack forward, teachers, come down. We want to pray for you as well. Administrators, we want to pray for you. Secretaries, support staff of schools, we want to pray for you. And uh, Jacob Strasbaugh is going to be praying uh, for you at the end of that time. But just come forward. And if there are any kids or teachers down here, if there's any family that would like to just pray for their family members, come down and lay hands on them and, and we'll lift them up to the Lord this morning.
Ladies and gentlemen, my name is uh, Jake Strasbaugh, and uh, I was asked to pray today. Um, I serve as an administrator for Bobo District 201, um, formerly a teacher at Bobo East, and this year I got the opportunity to go work. Uh, the school opened up a brand new vocational and career program, so I'm excited to do that. But when they asked me to pray, uh, I said, yeah, absolutely. This is an exciting time of year for me as uh, someone in education. Um, I remember when I was a student, it was always bittersweet. The end of the summer's coming, but you're excited to see new friends, meet new people, meet new teachers. So if you would mind, bow your heads, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for everything that you do and all that you are. You provide us with grace, with love, and not because we've done anything to earn it, but simply because you love us. As the summer winds down and the school year approaches, we pray especially for our students. We pray for our teachers. We pray for any and all staff. And, and Lord, we pray for the parents. Oftentimes it's easy to be fearful of society, have worries about present and potential changes in the education system. But we have to understand that there is no politician. There's no policy maker. There's no administrator that can dictate where you are because Father God, you are everywhere. As we go into this school year, let us take those fears and turn them into teachable moments to help teach our students how to turn to you. For it's written that if we seek, we'll find, if we ask, we'll receive. When our students or our teachers or our staff face those moments of fear, anxiety, that they turn to you and that they know that you're there. We pray for those students who struggle with self-confidence, that they find a new confidence in you. We pray for those that are battling with mental health as it continues to grow and run rampant. We just ask that they find healing in your name, Father. We pray for those students who go to school in search of love and affection and attention because school is the only place that they get it. We just ask that your love flow through those teachers and staff and and shower on those students so that they feel your presence. We pray for those students that are subject to bullying, that your presence rebuke the bullying and help them find comfort in new ways. We pray for our teachers. We pray for, that you provide them with strength, patience, love, mercy. And we pray for the parents. As it's easy again to wonder and worry but help them to understand that that you're with them that their child's safety and their well-being is with you help them to find that peace we pray for the nurses we pray for the social workers we pray for the teachers assistants we pray for all staff at the school we just ask father god that this school year be filled with positive memories good fellowship, and successful education. Dear Lord, we ask all of these things in your mighty name. Amen. If your earthly father knows how to give you good gifts, how much more the heavenly father will give the Holy Spirit to them that ask. Spear the living God, fall fresh on me. You think God will do it? I do. He said he would. Let's stand.
And let's sing again of our Savior's love. seated. And now we invite our kindergarten through sixth graders to join me in the back as we head upstairs for kids worship. Yeah, uh, Miss Lindsay's there at the back. She just squeaked in at the end. They're like, is she coming? No, she's right there. Uh, we want to send you guys off to kids worship. We know you guys are going to have a wonderful time. Uh, well, it is, it is back to school season, and it's nice to see. We've got so many kids that are part of our church here, and uh, there are many here at 9, there are many at 11, and thank you, Jacob, for praying uh, for all of them and, and for having a teacher's heart and bringing that into worship. And there's a few, there, there, there we go, there's some late, late runners there. That's good. Uh, it's fun to have kids in worship, though, isn't it? Um, and one of the things that I love about kids is it reminds us that Jesus is working in the next generation. And it doesn't, Jesus isn't just faithful to your generation or my generation, but those who are coming after us, and Jesus is still working because God is still good. Um, every time we come to worship, we have an opportunity to give to the Lord who has been so generous to us. And how many of you would say that God has been so, so generous with St. Matthew? Oh, yeah, you better believe it. You better believe it. And he's been so generous to each and every one of us who are here. And it's because we've experienced the Lord's extravagant generosity, we have an opportunity to give back. Lord, not to try to repay anything, but to say, Lord, you have done something amazing in my life, and I want to be a part of what you're doing in other people's lives. So we have a few ways that you can give. If you're here in person, you can, uh, you'll can you find offering boxes at each entrance and exit. That is not there for admission. Some people say, well, if I come to church, you've got to bring an offer. That's not how this works. 
that is not an admission box. That's not the box office. That is a place where you can say to God, I'm so thankful for what you've done. Uh, let me express my gratitude to you financially. Um, so if you'd like to give that way, you can. There's a few other ways you can give. Uh, another way is to go to our website, uh, stmatthewumc.org slash give. There's a portal there where you can give. Or you can send a check in the mail to 1200 Moreland Drive. So whether you're in person or joining with us live online, you can all be a part of the ministry of St. Matthew and what God is doing here in Belleville through us. Lord, we thank you for your generosity. We thank you for your enduring faithfulness. Age to age, you are the same. And we root ourselves in that promise. We know that you're doing something uh, fantastic and unimaginably great in our next generation. And we pray, Lord, that, that we would not pass the buck here at St. Matthew, but we would see it as our responsibility to raise up the, the next generation, generation of, of young Christian leaders and teach them the teachings of Jesus, teach them the gospel so that they can be empowered by it and they can be transformed by it. And Lord, may our gifts go to that purpose. Lord, may our gifts be magnified. May they be multiplied for your kingdom here on earth, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
Wow, I love that. that. That's so good. Thank you for always leading us in worship, providing the, using the gift that God gave you in the context uh, of worship. It's such a beautiful thing. I'm grateful for that. I, the imagery of if the, if the ocean was an inkwell and every stalk on the planet was a pen and every person on the planet was a scribe, it would drain the oceans dry to write about the love of God. It's such a beautiful, beautiful hymn. Well, last week we wrapped up our, our series on hymns and lyrics for life, and that's a, that's a great lyric uh, for life. And I hope that each week you encounter hymns or songs or spiritual songs that, that are worth writing to the hard drive of your lives. Uh, because it's there that we do find that life, and and uh, that's a such a blessing. Well, um, as we we're starting off on a new series uh, today, and uh, the question is, it's called "Who Are You Following?" And um, and so before we d- jump into that, we're going to be looking at Acts chapter two, starting with verse thirty-seven. So if you brought your Bibles, you can open up to Acts chapter two, and then um, let's come to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we gather here to worship you, we've been worshiping you all morning, and we're grateful. We're grateful for the people that have written music, songs, and hymns, anthems. We're thankful, Lord, that that they were faithful to the call you placed on their lives, and, and because they used their gift of poetry or their gift of music, we have things that we still sing today that bring us life and hope and peace and, and joy. And Lord, as we enter into your word, we recognize that every time we open up your word, it's an opportunity to learn something new about who we are and who you are and who you're calling us to be in Jesus Christ. So would you allow your Holy Spirit free reign in this room? You have access to all of our hearts, Lord. Help us to connect the dots. Help us to draw the lines. Convict us and convince us. Move us closer to you, we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So um, when, I, when I call a, a series, Who Are You Following?, the culture in which we live might bring up certain uh, reference points for you, right? Because we live in, in an age of social media, Who Are You Following? Uh, has one connotation for sure. Uh, and, and for others, it might have other connotations. But you know, this, this day of um, Instagram specifically, like how many people are following you, you know, it, it's unfortunate because if you put your value in how many friends you have on Facebook or how many people are following you on Instagram, uh, let me just tell you that's a dead end street and it's not worth anything because your value is not dependent on how many friends you have on Facebook or how many people are following you on Instagram. If I've based my value on how many people follow me on Instagram, I would be a miserable wreck because there might be 15. Plus, I don't even look at it. I'm not even on it. So I I would think of myself as a failure if I had to use the culture uh, as you know, my, my measuring stick. But here's the thing. Um, there are a lot of people who follow others, right? Like as of January of this year, on Instagram, Kim Kardashian, maybe you know that name, Kim Kardashian had about 282 million followers. That's a lot of people who are caring what one person says. <laughs> Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, in all the movies, right, has about 292 million people following him. Kylie Jenner has 305 million people following her. And do you know who was in the number one spot as of January of this year? Cristiano Ronaldo. Ronaldo is a soccer player. And, and Ronaldo had about 394 million people following him on Instagram. 
Now, that's just fine for them. But beyond that culture, there is underneath of all of the cultural influences of following and social media, underneath of that, there lies a valid question because everyone is following someone. Did you know that? You might say, well, I don't follow anybody on Instagram. Well, you're following someone. And maybe it's the Lord Jesus. That would be a good thing. Or maybe you're following yourself. Or maybe you've put another human being in a person uh, or in a position of influence over your life and you're following them. But everyone is following someone. But I wonder how many are following Jesus. Now you might say, well, Bob, there are approximately 2.38 billion Christians on this planet. And you'd, you'd be close, with, give or take a million, whatever it is, right? You'd be close. But the question is not how many people claim Christianity. It is how many people are following Jesus. There is a difference. There is a very big difference. So I hope you can be here over the next three weeks because we're talking about following Jesus and what that means. Why is this important? Here's why this is important. Because recently I was reading an article about some of the major shifts that are happening in our culture. And I can't remember who said it presently, but this was the gist of what I read that absolutely blew me away. This guy was talking about um, how there was an atheist who was, was wanting to, you know, dealing uh, with the issue of God. And, and a person asked this atheist, like, you know, why are you an atheist? And the atheist had a realization when he was in this conversation with someone. He said, you know, I've always kind of said that I was an atheist, but anymore I would have to say I'm an apatheist. Meaning, I don't even care about the question of whether or not there's a God. Because people have forgotten that there is a day coming. Jesus will return. We will all stand before Jesus. So when people say, I'm just apathetic to the question of God, they have completely written him off. That is the culture in which we live. So you wonder why if you broach the subject of God with someone and they go, oh, whatever. You wonder why they say whatever? This is why. Because we live in a culture where we've become apathetic toward the whole question of God. So is it important to examine why should we be concerned about following Jesus? Absolutely. And and at no time in history has it ever been more important than it is right now. It's always an important question. Will I follow Jesus? So, um, here's the thing. We want to examine what it means to follow Jesus because unless we learn to follow Jesus, unless we learn to follow him, our faith in Jesus will always be incomplete. Are you with me? It's one thing to believe in Jesus, it's another thing to follow him. In fact, the decision to accept Christ is completed by the decision to follow Christ. The decision to accept Christ as my Lord and my Savior of my life, the forgiver of my sins, that decision to accept that gift from God is completed. It comes to full circle when I decide to follow him. You know, because belief is not the end goal. Jesus didn't say, now go into the world and make believers He didn't say, go and convince people to believe in me. He said, go and make a disciple. What is a disciple? A disciple is a follower. It is a lifelong learner. It is a student of the way of Jesus. So you might say, if believing is starting the car, 
then following is driving the car, getting someplace, going to a destination. You know, how many of us have had a dream to do something, right? Only to have that dream dissipate and we never acted on it. It just disappeared. You know, you might say, what is the follow through for belief? You know, and and that's a great question because there are follow throughs to what we believe in Jesus. And so that's what we're gonna be looking at this month. And so today, we're going to look at baptism. Because baptism, it's like, baptism is like the gate at the Kentucky Derby that's holding the horse, right? And when the, when the bell goes off, all the gates open and the horses are off and running, right? And so you could say that baptism is the gate through which we enter into the race, uh, to, to run the race with perseverance that God has set before us. Does that make sense? So baptism is the gate through which we go into our walk with Christ. And the scripture that we're looking at is um, the account of, uh, remember when Peter at Pentecost Um, The Spirit of God fell on the believers and Peter comes out. All these people had gathered from all different nations and and, and all around and Peter started, they're hearing the gospel preached in their own native tongue and they're like, what is going on? Like, are people drunk? Because they just, they don't seem themselves. Like, I don't understand what's happening. And Peter stands up to address the crowd and he says, friends, these people aren't drunk like you think. It's only nine o'clock in the morning they don't even do that you know it's not what you think but it's the spirit of God and so Peter gives us or yeah Peter gives this beautiful speech on Pentecost Sunday and where we're going to pick up in Acts chapter 2 verses uh, 37 to 41 we're going to pick up after um, after the Peter has given this speech so Acts chapter 2 and I'm going to read from the CEB Uh, which is, I think it's CEB I grabbed. Um, So, verse 37, listen to this. Um, When the crowd heard this, so Peter ends it saying, therefore let all Israel know beyond question that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, by the way, both Lord and Christ. God has made Jesus Lord. And so, verse 37, when the crowd heard this, they were deeply troubled. Literally, they were cut to the heart. They said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, change your hearts and your lives. You know, many of your translations say, repent, be baptized, all of you. Isn't it interesting in the CEB that it says, change your hearts and your lives the way you live. Each one of you must be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you, your children, and for all who are far away, as many as the Lord our God invites. With many other words, he testified to them and encouraged them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Those who accepted Peter's message were baptized. God brought about 3,000 people into the community that day. That's an important phrase. Because baptism not only has been a symbol of the gate through which we enter into the race, baptism has also been a symbol of the community into which we are reborn, right? And so he says uh, about 3,000 entered into the community that day. Now, did you catch verse 37? The people ask an important question. And the first thing they say is brothers. Now, we're going to read over that quickly. We know churches. We know how to speak church, right? And in many churches, some of you grew up in churches where you would call me Brother Bob, and I'd call you Sister Gina, right? And you might have grown up in a church where everyone was brother or sister. And, and even if you don't know that, you, you might have heard that somewhere along the line in church. 
But isn't it interesting that these people were cut to the heart with the message of Jesus and their first response is, brothers, what must we do to be saved? They already feel a kinship. If you were here last week, you saw Mary Helen Phillips and Cassie uh, Matika who were baptized up in, in the baptistry. And one of the beautiful things there was when I saw them holding hands you know, because, and, and I don't know, even thought about that, but what was so cool about it is here are two sisters holding hands and about to be baptized. And the same thing is happening in Acts. Brothers, we already recognize the connection that we have as family, but what in the world must we do to be saved? So, um, what must we do? What must we do? Do. It's not just about belief. It's about doing. And they knew instinctively there had to be more to the story than just believing. And, you know, James, the half-brother of Jesus, half-younger brother of Jesus, right? James confirmed this in James 2.19 when he said, even the demons believe. You say, well, I believe in Jesus. Well, so do the demons and they shudder when they think of Jesus. You say, yes, but I declare that Jesus is Lord. The demons did too. We know that you're the Son of God. What do you want with us? They knew that he was the Son of God. It's not just about belief. It's about following. So in our passage today, they're asking basically about what's the next step for me? And how many of us ask that question? Some of you have been walking with Jesus for 50 years. When was the last time you said, I wonder what my next step is? When was the last time you said to yourself, you know, I've been really in the word lately and I've been learning so much, I wonder what the next step for me is. It is a great question. Let me just throw that out there to you. It's a great question. Whether, you might say today, you know what, I've heard about Jesus you could say, you could ask the same question. I wonder what the next step is for me. Now that, or, or I'm just interested in learning more about Jesus. Great place to be. Now that you're interested in learning more, I wonder what the next step is. It doesn't matter how long you've known Jesus. This is a pertinent question for all of us. What's the next step? Well, think of 3,000 people coming to know Jesus. They wanted to seal the deal and be baptized as a follower of Christ. And and when I think of baptism, that's one of the things I think about. It's like the way to seal the deal, right? It's a way of saying, Lord, I know I believe and I have repented of my old way of doing life. I want to seal the deal and I want to be baptized into the way of Jesus. How does it happen? Well, it begins by a shift in our thinking. Repentance is a change of mind. You know, how many of you have ever had a change of mind? Raise your hand. We've changed our minds a hundred times today, maybe even, right? All of us know what it's like to change our mind, hopefully, because that's a sign of maturity, is it not? We used to think this way, but now I don't think that way. I changed my mind on this because I'm growing, right? So um, we do it all the time. We start thinking one way, but then we change our mind and go to another. Well, Acts 2, verse 38, it says, Peter says, repent and be baptized, all of you in the name of the Lord Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. Now, repent, in Greek, the noun is metanoia, and it, it means a turning away from, a, a, a turning away from an old way of doing life, turning toward God to live his way of life. In Greek philosophy, you know, it wasn't just the Bible. In Greek philosophy, they talked about metanoia. When someone changed their way of living for the better, they said they experienced metanoia. And this is just secular writing in philosophy in the time, you know. So, but for Christians, it was recognizing, you know what? 
I'm responsible for Jesus going to the cross. Wait. I mean, I used to think that it was just the Jewish people who called for Barabbas that were responsible for Jesus going to the cross, but now you're telling me that God sent Jesus into the world to die for the sins of the whole world. Well, that includes me. That means that my sins were responsible for sending Jesus to the cross. And when I have this awareness, it becomes very personal, and I realize that I'm responsible and then I have to go down that road of, well, why would you do that? And, and you, you hear him say, it's because I love you. That's why I did that. Because I wanted you to have a hope and a future. Because I wanted you to have an eternity with me. And the only way you could have gotten it is if I died for you and for your sin. It, it brings about a change of mind. It, turning from my old way of life and turning to a new one. That's why there can be 2.38 billion Christians in the world, but not 2.38 followers, million, billion followers. You follow? (laughs) Didn't mean that. I mean, I did, but a little fun. So, and and the reason that you can have 2.38 billion Christians and not 2.38 billion followers is because there are some Christians who have not had a change of mind. They have not repented. They have not turned away from their old way. They haven't embraced the way of living like Jesus. So what Peter says is, repent and be baptized, all of you, you know, because we express our faith through repentance. And then we declare our faith through baptism. Let me say that again. We, uh, We express our faith through repentance. We're expressing that we're turning away from our old way of life. But we declare our faith through baptism. Why? Because baptism is a public confession of you wanting to follow Jesus Christ. This is what it has always been. In other words, you may have grown up in a church or been around a church where the people who were baptized, they had to say something, you know, something of their testimony before they were baptized. But in the early church, the very fact that you were being baptized was a testimony in and of itself. Because it happened in the context of a public gathering of believers. And because it happened in a context of publicly in believers, if I went into the water and came up out of the water in your presence, now you have the ability to encourage me, to hold me accountable. I'm inviting you to be my community of faith so that we can come up up alongside each other and encourage one another in the faith. Don't give up, you got this, God's got this, you're not alone, you know? And we come up alongside each other and encourage one another. It becomes the declaration of our discipleship. It's a testimony in and of itself. You know, the word baptisma means literally to plunge under the water. Some will say that it means dipping as in dyeing a a garment. Did any of you ever do tie-dyeing? You got your five-gallon bucket, and you put your water in there, and you got your T-shirt, and you put your rubber bands on it, and you plunged the shirt into the dye. That's what baptism means. We are plunged under the water. The symbolism is rich. Because just as Jesus laid down his life and God the Father restored his life on Resurrection Sunday, so we identify with Jesus by dying to self and being raised to new life in Christ. It, the, the, symbol, the symbolism is, again, so rich. When you are submerged, plunged under the water, you are completely immersed in water. And what does that symbolize? It symbolizes a life where you are now going to be completely immersed in the Spirit of God. It's so beautiful. 
And in that process, we discover something new. You know, some people would say, like, over the, over the centuries, it got to the point where some churches believed that it was the water itself that was salvific. That somehow the water and the liturgy was bringing about a change in you. But the early church, it was just flipped. It wasn't the water and the liturgy brought about the regeneration. It was the Spirit of God brought about the regeneration and it was symbolized through water and liturgy. See the difference? It's a big difference! Because some people say, well, I'm baptized, so I'm going to heaven. Well, it's not biblical. So what is biblical is this change that happens within us. You say, how does that change happen? It happens by the Spirit of God doing a work in us that we can't do ourselves. And one day, the lights go on, you hear the gospel, and you're like, oh my gosh, I get it. Well, the reason that you just said you got it is because the Spirit of God is at work in your life. If, if changed lives and heaven and, and you know, being a Christ follower was all about something that I did, then it's too little because I ain't all that. None of us is, right? So a, a change mind leads to a new commitment. A new commitment. The second part of Peter's answer to them after repent is be baptized, all of you. You know, and what a beautiful symbol. Because, because something happens. If you watched Mary Helen go under the water and come back up, she still looked like Mary Helen Phillips. If you saw Cassie Matika go under the water and come back up, she still looked like Cassie Matika. But something's happened. There's been a public declaration. And so while, the, while it still looks the same, there are different characteristics now because of the public display of faith, uh, and their testimony basically, that I want to be known as a follower of Jesus. Um, David Garland uses the analogy of magnets. Like, do you remember when you were in third grade and they were covering science and they had, the teacher had a really big magnet and the magnet would go around and pick up paper clips and you were like, wow, that's really cool, you know? Like, how does it do that? Now, if you took one of those paper clips and the, before the magnet touched it and you tried to touch that paper clip to anything, nothing would happen. But if you left a paper clip on the big magnet for a long time, that paper clip became magnetized, didn't it? And when you took that paper clip after being magnetized, it had whole new properties. It could pick up another paper clip because it was magnetized. It still looked the same on the outside, but there were new properties within. The same is true with us. As followers of Jesus, when we publicly declare we are in, we're followers of Jesus, I'm declaring to you that I am a follower of Jesus and I want you to hold me accountable. I want you to speak into my life. I want you to encourage me. I want you to do all that thing. When I do that public testimony, something happens in me and I look the same on the outside, but something's different on the inside. Some of you, because you know your past, you go, that's exactly true of me because I know who I used to be. And I might look the same on the outside, but I'm not the same on the inside. And it's because Jesus changed me. Another way to say this is, baptism is the formal response to the call of God. One of the beautiful parts of the wedding, you know, is after the two people have given themselves to each other through the giving of their vows, they pledge their lives to each other through their vows, then I get the rings and I, I have a blessing of the rings and they exchange rings. I have a ring on my finger today. Why? Because I'm married. This ring is an outward sign of an inward grace or an inward reality, right? So this ring, every time I look at this ring, all right, the first thing is, every time I look at this ring, I remember that I lost my wedding band, <laughs> which is really sad. But um, so I, you know, I, I have a, a, a fill in. 
But every time I look at this ring, what I remember are the vows that I made to Gina. You know, in the name of God, I take you, Gina, to be my wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till we're parted by death. And every time I see this ring, that's what I remember. Those are the vows that I made. So this ring is an outward sign of something that happened inwardly. And that's what baptism is, isn't it? It's an outward sign of something that has happened inwardly. And it seals the deal, if you will. Those, those rings that we wear are an ever-present reminder of that reality. It's why I love in the Catholic Church, when you walk in, you dip your, your hand in holy water and you make a cross on yourself. Some of you are gonna dismiss that and say, oh, it's just traditionalism. Well, you can dismiss it, but it's a very beautiful thing. Taken at its best. Can it be abused? Of course. But at its best, it's so beautiful. Why? Because every person, when they walk into the family of God, they remember, oh yes, I am a baptized follower of Jesus. I'm all in to following Jesus. And before I walk out these doors, I'm going to do it again to remind myself that as I go into this world, I am a baptized follower of Jesus and I'm going to live as such. It's why it's such a beautiful part of the church if we understood what it meant, right? Baptism is the formal response to the call of God. Verse 39 and 41, this promise is for you. It's for your children and for all who are far off. For all whom the Lord our God will what? Call. For everyone that the Lord calls, this is for you. So you say, well, I don't know if I need to be baptized. Well, do you need to? That's a different conversation. But why wouldn't you want to? Why wouldn't you want to? Because if the Lord's called you, it's an opportunity to stand up in public and say, yep, I'm in too. And I can't help but think of Luke, is it Luke 9, where Jesus says, if you're ashamed of me and my gospel now in this adulterous generation, then the Son of Man will be ashamed of you when he comes into his glory. I think about that and I'm like, wow, well, what a beautiful way for me to stand up and say, nope, I'm in. I am in to all who will call. We want to give our lives to him. And lastly, I will say that baptism demonstrates that we belong to and identify with Jesus. This is the whole point of baptism, that we belong to him. We've been immersed in him, and now we identify with his way of life. Um, you know, again, the, the, all the imagery of, of being dying to self, being raised to new life, you know, and all that is such a beautiful thing. And I think about one of the stories that just to me sums this whole thing up about baptism is in Acts chapter 8. And maybe you remember this. Uh, the angel of the Lord came to Philip and, and uh, said to Philip, I want you to go down uh, you know, to, toward, to, uh, from Jerusalem to Gaza. It's about 50 miles or so. And on his way, Philip's way to uh, Gaza, he comes across, the, he sees this Ethiopian eunuch who's in a chariot and he's reading something. And this guy, this Ethiopian eunuch, was in charge of the treasury of Candace in some of your translations. In other translations, it says the, um, the treasury of Kandake. But Candace was the queen, and, and she oversaw the treasury of the Ethiopians. And he's in this chariot, and he's reading. And the spirit tells um, Philip, go up to the chariot and just wait. So Philip goes, goes up to the chariot, and he overhears the Ethiopian reading from the book of Isaiah. And Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? This, by the way, is a great evangelism question. If somebody brings up church, you know, what a great thing to say. Do you understand everything about church? Is there any way I could maybe share with you my understanding, you know? Do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian eunuch says, how could I? 
unless someone explains it to me. And so Philip begins to share the, the story of Jesus. Now, we know what the Ethiopian eunuch was reading in Acts chapter eight because um, it's written down. And it's from uh, Isaiah 53. So in Acts chapter eight, um, he says, uh, this is verse 32, this was the passage of scripture he was reading, uh, Acts 8, 32. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shear its, is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was taken away from him. Who can tell the story of his descendants because his life was taken from the earth? And that's what he's reading. So Philip says, let me tell you about this one that it's speaking of. Because the eunuch asks Philip, verse 34, tell me, about whom does the prophet speak? Is this about the prophet himself who was gonna be cut off? Or was it of someone else? And so Philip begins to tell the story. Now, why is that so important? You remember the rest of the story? After Philip shares the whole story of Jesus, which must have included Pentecost, because baptism had to have come up, because the Ethiopian eunuch says, hey, there's water down there. What's preventing me from being baptized right now? And so they go and they're baptized, and as soon as the Ethiopian eunuch comes up out of the water, Philip's gone, gone, taken up, away. All right, so why is that so important? Here's why. Because um, there are a couple of things that the eunuch would have had in tension. Um, the first is, let me see if I have it pulled up here. In Deuter anybody know Deuteronomy 23 verse one? Is that one that you submitted to memory in kids club? It reads like this. No one, sorry, it's not at Kids Club. No one who has been emasculated by crushing or cutting may enter the assembly of the Lord. What is that speaking of? It's speaking of a eunuch. Anyone who has been emasculated, in other translations, it gets more explicit, but Anyone who's been emasculated by crushing or cutting is not, uh, is forbidden. They cannot be in the assembly of the Lord. But there's another passage in Isaiah, I think it's Isaiah 56, verse 3. Listen to this. Now, remember this is after Isaiah 53. I don't know if the, if the Ethiopian eunuch had come across this yet, but in, in Isaiah 56, verse 3, it says, don't let the immigrant who has joined with the Lord say, the Lord will exclude me from the people. And don't let the eunuch say, I am just a dry tree. The Lord says, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, choose what I desire and remain loyal to my covenant. In my temple and courts, I will give them a monument and a name. The eunuch is holding these two things in tension. He knows that by law, he's not allowed to go to worship, yet he's on his way to Jerusalem. And yet he knows, maybe he knows Isaiah 56 that says that the Lord has a place for the eunuch. And he's reading this passage about one who is cut off from his descendants. Do you think that this Ethiopian had a sense of identifying with Jesus as one who was like him, who was cut off, who would never have descendants? One who was like silent, silent before his shears, like a lamb is before its shears. He was silent. He didn't do anything. He couldn't change his circumstances. He identified with Jesus. And because he identified with Jesus, he wanted to be baptized. So, as we close this, let me just say, I don't know if you're, if you've never crossed that bridge, I want to encourage you to do it to be baptized, why? Because it's a public testimony of your desire to follow Jesus. Maybe you're here today and you're like, I, I'm still searching. Well, you keep searching. You keep searching because the promise is, if you seek me, you will find me. Jesus said that. So you can take that one to the bank. 
Keep searching. And, and I find it so fitting that we're celebrating communion today because, uh, and by the way, if any of you did not get one of these on your way in, would you, we've got some people that'll help bring those around. Just raise your hand wherever you are and uh, the ushers will bring this by so that you can have the elements. But um, I, I, if you've never made a decision to publicly follow Jesus, I wanna encourage you to do that. And, and I hope that today has given you just a framework to see that baptism is, it, it's taking the plunge. It's saying I'm all in. It's saying publicly to this community of believers, I'm just like you, brother. I'm just like you, sister. And we're following this Jesus together. And if you've never done that, I want you to know you can always just call me, you can email me, and come up to me after this service and say, I'm interested. I want to be, I want to, I want to seal the deal and make this official. And if that's you, I hope that you'll, um, I hope that you'll do that and act on it. So um, before we uh, take communion, Carrie and Tom are going to play some music. And as they're playing, I wanted to create a little space for us to spend some time with the Lord. Maybe it's an opportunity for you to say, Lord Jesus, I want you to come into my life. Change me. If you've never asked that, ask it now. Maybe it's an opportunity to offload some things that you've been carrying that you need to give over to the Lord. Maybe there are some things that you need to confess to the Lord and receive his forgiveness. But in this holy moment that we create just to spend time one-on-one with the Lord. They're going to start playing, and then sometime after they start, I'll lead us through the act of communion. But let's spend some time with the Lord now. Father, we know that you are always calling us to come home. You're always calling us back to yourself because we all, like sheep, have gone astray. And you're calling us back. And so, Lord, we thank you for this holy mystery in which you reveal yourself to us. And we remember that it was on the night that Jesus was betrayed that he invited his close friends to an upper room. We remember, Lord, how he took the bread and broke it and gave it to his disciples and told them to remember him every time they ate of it. And we remember, Lord, how at the end of the meal, how Jesus took the cup and blessed it and and said, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. And as often as we participate in the bread and the cup that we are proclaiming your life your ministry, your death, and your resurrection until you come again in final glory. So Lord, we lay before you our brokenness just like the bread was broken. We lay before you our brokenness and we receive the forgiveness that you've offered us through Jesus. And Lord, we offer our strength, our power, our our intellect, everything represented by the blood, 
we give that to you and we receive the power and strength of Jesus who, who offers to live inside us through his Holy Spirit. So Lord, we, we give you ourselves as an act of worship in Jesus' name. Would you pour out now your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and cup and make them be for us, the body and blood of Christ, so that we can be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until that great and glorious day when we're feasting at your heavenly banquet. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Jesus took the bread and he said, this is my body. So take and eat and do it in remembrance of me. And Jesus said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. So drink all of you. And as often as you do, remember me. Gracious and loving God, once again, we thank you for this mystery. We thank you for this simple but powerful way to remember the very last supper that Jesus had with his disciples, giving us a way to remember as often as we would do it, the price that Jesus paid. So we give you our lives once more and pray that you would use us to be a blessing to someone in Jesus' name. We pray all these things in his mighty name. Amen. Shall we stand all over the house as we sing, have, I have decided to follow Jesus. Three things. One, uh, thanks for all the well wishes on my birthday. Um, 60 seems really old, but uh, that's okay. Uh, I'll get over it. Like in about a year, I'll get over it. Uh, secondly, next, don't forget next week, um, it, we're having one service at 10 a.m. And uh, we're, it's going to be combined, the 9 and the 11 combined, and we're all going to be in the room together. And then afterwards, we've got this great way of putting our faith into action. I hope you'll be a part of that. Third, um, we still have needs for some of the things for Project Compassion. So you can pick up a sheet of the things that we need to put in the backpacks for students that don't have things. And so if you want to grab a sheet before you leave, you can pick those up, bring them in, in any time uh, during the week or next Sunday even, and we'll, we'll have that already. But as you go from this place to go from today, 
pretend like we have a bowl of water in the back so that you could dip your hand in that water and remember that you are a baptized follower of Jesus Christ, if you are. And if you're not, again, I hope that you'll consider doing that as a public confession of what he's doing in your life. Amen? And may the grace of, and the love of the Lord Jesus shine through you uh, in every relationship you encounter this week. Amen? Have a great week. Okay.